can we grow in the spiritual authority that we have received as believers in Jesus Christ? That's what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes this morning. How many of you remember when you first got your driver's license, how many of you remember your first time behind the wheel alone? How many of you remember your first solo trip? I remember it vividly. I was 17 when I got my driver's license. I spent uh, a number of months learning to drive like you did. Went through driver's ed and written tests and, and hours of instruction behind the wheel with an instructor whose hair turned remarkably white during that time. <clears throat> when I finally received my driver's license, I was authorized to drive alone. But, you know, I wasn't very confident yet. I was still very cautious. I was nervous about forgetting something. I remember when I got behind the wheel thinking, I have to remember how to get places. I haven't paid attention all these years, and I have to find my way places. <clears throat> I had the authority to drive, but I wasn't fully comfortable using it yet. 32 years later, I, I have literally driven hundreds of thousands of miles. I went to college in Maine. My sister went to college in Minnesota, and I used to drive her back and forth from Philly. I went to graduate school in Missouri. While I was there, I pastored a church that was 60 miles away. I fell in love with a Canadian, and so we've spent 20-something years driving back and forth. So now I'm completely comfortable driving. It's like second nature to me. All kinds of traffic conditions, all kinds of weather conditions, day and night, all kinds of vehicles. I have the authority to drive, and I'm comfortable using it. And that's precisely what God wants for us as believers in Jesus. You see, through Jesus, God has given to each one of us spiritual authority. And God doesn't want us to stay novices using our authority. He wants us to grow in our ability. He wants us to be able to use our authority well to bring God glory and to bring a blessing to others. The hallmark of Jesus' ministry was a demonstration of spiritual authority like the world had never seen. Jesus had authority on his teaching that was irresistible. Even his enemies were in awe of his teaching. One of my favorite moments in the life of Jesus is when the chief priest sends the temple guard to arrest Jesus. And they go and they become so enamored in his teaching, they forget to arrest him. And they come back later and the chief priest said, what happened? And they said, we couldn't help ourselves. No one has ever spoken like this man did. Jesus had authority over evil spirits that tormented people. He had authority to dispatch angels to do whatever he commanded. He had authority over nature. He had authority to forgive sins. He had authority to bring shalom, to bring peace and wholeness to people. He had authority over diseases and death. Jesus had authority to bring the kingdom of God down to a community, to a group of people. And Jesus has bestowed that same authority to his apostles and to his church. You might remember during his earthly ministry, Jesus called together his followers and he gave them authority to bring the kingdom and he sent them out. Jesus authorized them to teach the gospel with results. He authorized them to heal the sick, to deliver the tormented, to release peace. And the group came back rejoicing at what God had done. Jesus said, yeah, I know. He said, I saw it from here. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning over the places where you were ministering. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he bestowed that same authority on us, his church. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And as the Father sent me in authority, now I am sending you in authority to go and to bring the kingdom to people. The book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament show us that the early church knew how to use their authority. They knew how to bring the kingdom of God to people and to places. Looking at these opening lines of Romans, I want you to notice with me how Paul is exercising his authority in Christ. The church in Rome didn't have a spiritual father. Apparently, the Roman church was founded by 
Jews who had been visiting Jerusalem during the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Based on what they saw and heard, they became believers in Yeshua. They became believers in the Jewish Messiah and they went back to Rome and started to spread the gospel. The Roman church did have pastoral leaders like Priscilla and Aquila, but they didn't have a spiritual father. And so Paul is reaching out to them as an apostolic father. But what gave him the right to do that? What gave him the confidence to exercise his authority? And what lessons can we learn from him? How can we grow in our authority in Christ? How can we grow in our authority to be Become kingdom bringers wherever we are. Looking at these opening lines of Romans, I see five ways that we grow in authority. And I want to go through them with you quickly this morning. Five ways that we grow in our authority to be kingdom bringers. The first way is this. Authority comes from discovering our and. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have been united with Christ by faith, you have received an and. Look at verse 5 of Romans 1. Through Jesus Christ and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship. When Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, Paul received not only the grace of salvation, he also received an and. Paul received grace and and a call to apostolic ministry. He received grace and a call to preach the gospel to Gentile nations and before Gentile kings. And before his life was over, Paul did just that. He preached the gospel to the Roman emperor and to the furthest boundaries of the Roman Empire. Apostolic ministry was Paul's and. Paul was a, an apostle in a unique sense. He was among that elite group that were eyewitnesses to the risen Christ. He was uniquely authorized to testify about Jesus in writing that was appointed by the Holy Spirit to become Holy Scripture. None of us will be an apostle like Paul or Peter or James. Only a handful of believers today are called to be apostles in a broader sense. Nevertheless, I want you to know that we all have an and. Every one of us who has received the grace of salvation has received an and. We've received a ministry call. We have received a place, a vital function in the body of Christ. We're going to get to Romans 8.28 in a little bit. But you already know the words to Romans 8.28. And we know this, that all things work together for good for those who love God. Amen. I'm sorry, what? Uh, what did you say? And. All things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How many people here love God? See, if you love God, you have an and attached to you. When you discover what that and is, you grow confident in using your authority in that capacity. How could Paul presume to become an apostolic father over a group of believers that he did not found nor had ever visited? Well, it's because it was Paul's and, and he knew it. And in the same way, when we know our and, it gives us confidence to step forward and use our authority. What is your and? Well, that's for God to know and for you to find out. And God wants you to find out. My and is pastoral ministry. I received grace and a calling to be a pastor. Your and might be prophetic ministry. Your and might be evangelism. It might be teaching. It might be discipling believers into maturity in Christ. Your and might be healing ministry. It might be deliverance ministry. Your and might be administrative leadership in the body of Christ. Your and might be a ministry of practical helps, doing practical things that bless other believers and build them up, help them. Your and might be a ministry of hospitality. It might be a ministry of encouragement. It might be a ministry of Christian counseling, applying the truth of God's word to people's situations. Your and might be a ministry of giving. It might be worship ministry. It might be prayer ministry. Listen, your and 
might be to raise a son who's going to become a Moses to his generation. Your and might be to raise a daughter who's going to become a Deborah to her generation. There was a, a woman in the town of Joppa. Her name was Dorcas, and her and was to sew clothing for the poor. And her and was so valuable that when she got sick and died, the church insisted to God that they couldn't do without her, and God agreed, so he let her life return to her body. As our friend Jackson Sinyunga says, some believers are unbearable, but Dorcas was unburyable. Her and made her indispensable, and I want to tell you, your and does too. When you discover your and, you begin to see the whole journey of your life in a different light. Looking back on his life, Paul saw that God had set him apart for his and while he was still in his mother's womb. He says in verse 1 of Romans 1, I was set apart for the gospel of God. Paul came to realize that even before he met Jesus, the whole journey of his life was orchestrated by God to prepare him for his and. Paul was born a Roman citizen, raised in the Greek city of Tarsus. Although he was a Jew, he grew up as a boy side by side with Gentiles. When he was 13, his father sent him to Jerusalem, where he became the star pupil of Rabbi Gamaliel. As a Greek-speaking Jew, Paul arrived in Jerusalem as an outsider, but he aspired to become first among insiders, and he did. And then Paul met Jesus, and he became hated as a Jewish traitor. And before his apostolic ministry really got started, Paul went back to Tarsus for 10 more years as an adult, where he works sewing tents. Think about it with me. Think about the wisdom of God. Who better could God have called to become an apostle to the Gentiles than Paul? He had the rights of a Roman citizen. He understood the thinking and culture of the Greeks. He was an expert in Jewish theology and Jewish apologetics. He knew what it was like to be a Jew who was an outsider to the Jerusalem power circle. He knew what it was like to be an insider. And he knew what it was like to be called a traitor because of Jesus. Who better could lead churches across the Roman Empire made up of Jewish and Gentile believers together in Yeshua, Jesus? You know, even Paul's ferocious persecution of believers was something that God could use later as part of his and. Paul saw Stephen and others die for Jesus while interceding for their persecutors in love, just like Jesus did. Paul remembered that later when he suffered persecution and then encouraged other believers in Christ who were being persecuted. The whole journey of Paul's life became part of his and. He could speak authoritatively to all kinds of different situations because Jesus had brought him through them. And I want to tell you in the same way, just like Paul, the whole journey of your life is part of your and. All of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it has qualified you to speak authoritatively on the subject to others and to tell them Jesus brought me through and he can bring you through too. The circumstances of your upbringing, the dramatic transitions of your life, the traumatic experiences, your accomplishments, your failure, all of it, God has brought you through and it is part of your and now and it gives you authority to minister to others in the same place. I have an assignment for you. I know you don't like homework, but I have authority, so you have to do it. I want you to write something down. If you're taking notes, I want you to write something down. Or uh, maybe if you have a little note patch on your, on your iPhone that you use, you can do that. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to write down these words. When I met Jesus, I received grace and, and I want you to put a blank there. And I want you to pray about what belongs in that blank. Some of you already know what belongs in that blank. But if you don't know what belongs in that blank, I want you to pray and ask Jesus to reveal to you what goes in that blank. When I receive Jesus, I receive grace and. What is it? What is your and? 
And if you don't know, I want you to pray and ask God. And I, prom I promise you, this is a prayer that the Holy Spirit will not fail to answer. He'll let you know what your and is. And if you are one of those people that already knows that I want you to pray this week, that God will just help you grow in your capacity to, to minister in your and. How can we grow in our authority to become kingdom bringers? Five ways in Romans 1. Authority comes from knowing our end. Second, authority comes from living like we are owned. When my son beats me in a game, which is far more often than I care to admit, he says to me, ooh, you just got owned. <laughs> owned means you've been utterly humiliated. It means you've been dominated. You have been defeated. And I want to tell you, when you became a believer in Jesus, when you received, when you met Jesus, you not only received the grace of salvation and a ministry calling, but you also got owned. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians. He makes a word picture, and he pictures himself as a prisoner of war in a victory parade, chained behind a Roman chariot. And in that Roman chariot is General Jesus, the one who has captivated his wild heart, the one who has conquered his wild heart. Here in Romans 1 verse 1, Paul says, I am a love slave of Jesus. In verse 9, he says, I serve God with my whole spirit. That means his whole being. In verse 14, he says, I have an obligation to preach to the Gentiles. You see, to belong to Jesus means that we are owned Paul says in Romans, you too are called to belong to Jesus. You too are set apart as his holy people. You too are called to the obedience of faith. To belong to Jesus means that we have forfeited the exclusive rights to our own life. You know, the philosophy of the world is express yourself. Be true to yourself. Fulfill yourself. Pursue whatever makes you happy. But Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself and follow me. To belong to Jesus means that we're not free to do whatever we want, but we're duty-bound to do what he wants. It means that we're obligated to serve him. We're at his beck and call because we've been bought with a price. To belong to Jesus means that we live in a place of surrender and humility. Can I tell you that we're not always so good at that as American Christians? All we want is the freedom to do all we want. But I want you to know that that's not the obedience of faith. I like what John Stott said. He said it's impossible to accept Jesus Christ as Savior without surrendering to him as Lord. But listen, here's what happens when we live like we're owned. When we live like we're owned... God is our witness, and he gives us supernatural results to our life. Paul says in verse 8, I serve God with my whole spirit. That means his whole being, and so God is my witness. Now, how did God serve as Paul's witness? Well, God gave Paul supernatural results wherever he went. When Paul preached the gospel, supernatural conviction fell on the hearers, and they believed. When Paul preached the gospel, signs and wonders occurred. People were healed. People were delivered from evil spirits. It was the same with the ministry of Jesus. Paul says in Romans 1 verse 2 that Jesus lived by the spirit of holiness. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, Jesus lived like he was owned. And so God served as a witness to Jesus' life by authorizing him to do signs and wonders and miracles. Peter said, God accredited Jesus to you by miracles and signs and wonders that God did through him. And when we're owned by the Son and we live like it, God is our witness and he allows the power and the authority of the kingdom to flow through our lives and our ministries. We have spiritual influence over the people in our life. We make a big impact on them. We're able to bring the kingdom to them because we live like we are owned. How can we grow in our authority to become kingdom bringers? Five ways in Romans 1. The third one is this. Authority comes from deep conviction about the gospel. 
I want you to notice with me that Paul's opening words in Romans 1 ooze with confidence. He is certain when he reaches Rome that something good is going to happen. He's certain that he has a valuable deposit to give to them. He's certain they're going to benefit from his visit. He's certain that he's going to have a great harvest of souls. Where does Paul's confidence come from? Well, Paul was confident in the message of the gospel itself. Paul was convinced that the gospel is inherently powerful. He's convinced that the message would work. He was convinced that the message would not fail to convict people and bring them to a moment of faith in Jesus Christ. Beloved, I want to tell you, the gospel is still powerful. The gospel still works. The gospel still convicts people. It still brings them to that point of faith in Christ. The gospel is powerful because its content comes from God. The gospel is not the invention of a man or a group of men. It is the gospel of God. The content of the gospel is Jesus. And the details of his life and his death and his resurrection were told centuries before he came. Do you know Jesus fulfilled more than 300 prophecies, more than 350 prophecies that were made about him in the Old Testament? There was a Harvard math professor who uh, gave his students an assignment. They selected eight prophecies, just eight out of over 350 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. They selected just eight of the prophecies. And he said, calculate the mathematical probability that one man could fulfill just eight of these prophecies. The students crunched the numbers and they came up with the answer that the probability was one in ten to the 28th power. I want to tell you that that's a number that's so astronomical that it's essentially a mathematical impossibility. God is the author of the gospel. It is the word of God. And it is powerful because the content comes from him. The gospel is powerful because it's God's appointed means of calling people to salvation. In the plan of God, he ordained that through the foolishness of preaching, people would come to be saved. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes beloved look at me for a minute even if you don't feel confident in yourself even if you don't feel confident in your credentials even if you don't feel confident in your speaking ability you can have absolute confidence in the message the message is inherently powerful Paul went to Rome full of confidence that the message wouldn't fail. Why? Not because of Paul, but because God had entrusted him with a message that cannot fail. How can we grow in our authority in Christ? Five ways in Romans 1. Number four, authority comes from praying in the Spirit. And by that I mean specifically praying in tongues. What gave Paul the authority to become a spiritual father to a church he did not found and he had never visited. Well, even though Paul had not yet met the Romans, he had already logged many hours praying for them in the spirit. Verses 8 and 9, God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of of his son is my witness, how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. The prominent New Testament scholar Gordon Fee sees in Paul's words here a reference to praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. Paul made intercession in the Spirit for the city of Rome and for the Roman believers, and that gave him the spiritual authority to come there and minister. For those of you who are intercessors, or for those of you who feel a call to the ministry of prayer, or for those of you who are praying for a family member or a friend or someone to receive Christ, listen to what intercession does. How does intercession increase our authority to minister? A couple of things here. First of all, intercession increases God's love in our heart for places and for people. Romans 5 says that the Holy Spirit lavishly pours God's love into our heart. And when we pray in the Spirit for people, 
God fills our heart. The Holy Spirit fills our heart to overflowing for love with them. And love is the basis of all ministry in the kingdom. Jesus was moved with compassion for people, with God's love, and then he ministered to them. And so as we intercede for people in this spirit, our friends, our family members, our coworkers, our neighbors, people that we're going to go see and minister to as we pray for them in this spirit, God fills our heart with love for them. How does intercession increase our authority? A second way, intercession yields spiritual insight into places and people. In Romans 8, Paul says that the Spirit helps us to pray in alignment with God's will because sometimes we just don't even know how to pray for someone. You ever have someone in your life, you say, Lord, I don't know how to pray for him. I don't know whether to pray for lightning to fall from heaven and just get them real good. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to pray for this person. Well, when we pray in the spirit, when we pray in the language that God has given us, the Holy Spirit helps us to begin praying in alignment with the will of God for that person. He alerts us to what the needs are. He shows us what the threats are, what their weaknesses are. Paul had never think about this. Paul had never been to Rome. And yet he writes a pastoral letter that addresses all the problems in the church in Rome, all the concerns in the church in Rome. How did Paul know what to write about? Well, it's because he spent time praying in the Spirit for them. And so the Holy Spirit revealed to him what the need was and how to address it. And in the same way, when we intercede for people in the Spirit, God gives us spiritual insight into what's going on and how to pray about it and how to address it. How does intercession increase our authority to minister? Number three, intercession prepares us to minister the gifts of the Holy Spirit to people. As we pray in the Spirit, Paul says that our faith is built up and our spiritual sensitivity is heightened. As we pray in the Spirit, our, our spiritual eyes and ears are attuned so we know what is going on. And as we pray in the Spirit, the Spirit alerts us beforehand to what God wants to do through us. If you remember, Jesus always prayed for long periods before he went and ministered. And Jesus said, I, I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. Well, when did Jesus see and hear the Father? It was during his times of prayer. In prayer, Jesus received the Father's intentions before he ever even arrived someplace. That's why he said to his disciples on a few occasions, hey guys, we have to go this way. We have to go through this town. We have to go through here. We have to pass through Samaria. I have an appointment waiting at a well for me there. God let him know because he prayed in the spirit. God let him know beforehand what wonderful thing God was going to do. What would happen if we started every day praying in the spirit and asking God, Lord, what do you want to do today? Lord, what appointment, what divine appointment. I, I, I had a wonderful conversation with a hairdresser recently uh, who's a believer in Jesus. And she said, I started praying at the beginning of every day. I started praying over my appointments that each one would become a divine appointment. And she said, as I started praying that inevitably, she said, people sit in my chair and they start pouring out my, their hearts to me and telling me things that they wouldn't tell anybody. And she said, I have an opportunity, a window of opportunity to share Christ and speak the good news of Jesus into that situation. What would happen if we started every day praying in the spirit? God, what, what, what have you planned to do through me today? God, how you, do you want to use me today? Because Paul prayed, he already knew what was God was going to do when he got to Rome. He already knew that God was going to use him to administer a gift that was going to greatly strengthen the church. He already knew that a great number of people were going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. How does intercession increase our authority to minister? Number four, intercession prepares people to receive the gifts flowing through us. Here's what happens when we pray for people in the spirit. We are prepared to administer gifts to them, and they are prepared to receive the gifts from us. I want you to follow me. You remember, it says that Jesus went to his own hometown one day, and it says he couldn't do many miracles there because the people lacked faith. Now listen, Jesus was not lacking in power to do miracles. The problem is, is that people have to have faith to receive them. 
So it, 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 how many times did Jesus say to people, go your way, your faith has made you whole? Jesus was never lacking in power to do a miracle, but it, when people were lacking in faith to receive them, they couldn't get the miracle. And as we pray over people in the spirit, we not only gain the authority to administer a gift to them, but those people, they gain the faith to receive it from us. Intercession plows the hard grounds in people's hearts and prepares them to receive the work of the Holy Spirit. How does intercession increase our authority to minister? Number five, intercession for believers increases their faith. It stabilizes them. It makes them strong and steady and courageous. Romans 1 reveals something powerful about praying in the Spirit. We know that when we pray in the Spirit, we are edified personally. Our faith is built up, but when we pray in the Spirit for others, their faith is built up. Paul says, I have prayed consistently for you in the Spirit, and your faith has become famous around the world. There was an apostle in Corinth praying for a church in Rome. And because he was praying for them in the spirit, their faith was built and became famous all over the world. They came into the obedience of faith. They were able to build one another up in faith. Everybody look at me for one minute. Imagine what would happen if we all started praying in the spirit more. Imagine what would happen. Not every one of us has yet received a, a language for praying, uh, a prayer and worship language from heaven. Many of us have. Imagine what would happen if we all started praying in the spirit more. Uh, imagine what would happen in our family. Imagine what would happen in our circle of friends. Uh, imagine what would happen in our church if we started praying in the spirit more. How can we grow in our authority to be kingdom bringers Five ways in Romans 1. Here's the last way. Worship team, come help me. Authority comes from persevering in love for others. One final thing I want you to notice about Paul. Paul had been trying to get to Rome for a long time, but he was prevented. About 30 years. He says, I was prevented. We don't know what prevented Paul specifically. In some places, he says the Holy Spirit prevented him. In other places, he says Satan prevented him. He was wrestling with the Corinthians for about two years. Things were a mess there, and Paul felt like he couldn't move further west until everything was settled and resolved. We don't know what it was that prevented him. He was prevented from going, but I want you to notice that he never gave up. Amen. I want you to notice that even though his plans fell through, he kept making plans. Even though his prayers went unanswered, he kept praying. And I find two insights into Paul's prayer for people, and I'm going to close with this. Two insights in how we can persevere in love for people. First of all, we can persevere in love for continually giving thanks for the people that God has put in our line of sight. For continually giving thanks for the people that God has put in our life and put in our orbit. Listen, someone needs to hear this today. You are where you are in life because God put you there specifically to be a blessing to the people around you. You work where you work right now, not by accident, but God put you where you work right now to be a blessing to the people around you. God put you in the neighborhood that you're in to be a blessing to the people around you. And how do we begin praying for these people so that we can bring the kingdom to them? Well, we begin by simply giving thanks for them didn't bother Paul that there was a church in Rome that he didn't start. He was just thankful they were there. He was just thankful that there was a gospel light in Rome. He was just thankful that there was Jesus loving people in Rome. He was thankful that the incense of worship and prayer was going up from the capital city of the empire. Paul wasn't jealous. He was thankful. He wasn't competitive. He was thankful. He wasn't ambitious. He was thankful. He just gave thanks that they were there. On Friday evening, we celebrated Passover here in the sanctuary with our friends from Messiah's house. We had friends from Presbyterian Church of Old Greenwich. We had friends from Revive Church in Stamford and from the Upper Room in Ridgefield, Connecticut, from churches all over. As I looked around the room, I said, Lord, I'm just so thankful that they're here. 
I'm just so thankful that there are Jesus-loving people all over the region. I'm thankful that there are Jesus-loving people in Mount Kisco and in White Plains and in Bedford and in Stanford and in Port Chester. I'm thankful that there is the incense of worship and prayer going up. Imagine what would happen in the body of Christ across this region if we just were thankful for one another. Lord, I'm thankful that they're there. And as we give thanks to God for the people that he's put in our line of sight, we grow in authority. If you want to know how to begin praying for the people around you, just begin by thanking God for them. Begin by thanking God for giving them life and breath. Begin by thanking God for making them fearfully and wonderfully unique. Begin by thanking God for what he's doing in their lives and for what he wants to do. How can we persevere in love? We give thanks for people. And second, continually want more for the people in your line of sight. Paul was not only thankful for the Romans, he wanted more for them. More faith, more strength, more knowledge, more of the Father's love, more gifts of the Holy Spirit, more spiritual influence in their city, more harvest, more vision for missions. That's exactly how we pray for people in our line of sight. We give thanks to God for them, and we pray more for them. Whatever their experience in God so far, we pray for more. Lord willing, we're leading a missions team to Nepal in July. Never been to Nepal before. And the Nepal team, this is how we're going to pray in advance of going to a city where we've never been and meeting people we've never met, we're going to pray by giving thanks for them and by asking God to give them more. And we're going to pray in the Spirit. After Nepal, I'm scheduled to go to Delhi, India, Lord willing. I've been invited back to Los Angeles, to the Angeles Temple, the School of Acts in Kuala Lumpur. And before going to all of those places, this is how I'm praying giving thanks to God for those people and I'm praying that God will give them more and that I'm praying for them in the spirit. Here's your second assignment and we're done. Your first assignment is to write, when I met Jesus, I received grace and, and put a blank and ask God to help you fill in that blank. Here's your second assignment. I want you to write down the names of three to five people in your orbit. Family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, and I want you to pray for them every day this week by giving thanks for them and by asking God that whatever their experience is, they'll receive more. How can we grow in our authority to be kingdom bringers? Authority comes from discovering our hand. It comes from living like we're owned. It comes from a deep conviction about the gospel, from praying in the spirit and persevering in love. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise this morning. Come on, give Jesus a praise. Would you?